This is Isaka's Off Stage, Off Script. Hey folks, my name is Chris Damali, Director of Channel Business Development with Isaka, and we're really excited to be chatting with you here today. Thanks for taking the time with us. Uh, we've got on the line here uh, Carl Klasik, who is the Director of Product Marketing Security Operations for ServiceNow. And uh, we had a great presentation from Carl uh, back in September, uh, and we had many questions for him as the follow-up, uh, which is the purpose of today's conversation. Uh, just for a little bit of background on Carl, uh, he's over 15 years of experience in product positioning and marketing for enterprise security platforms, including SIEM, SOAR, and Endpoint Technologies, most recently doing product marketing uh, in at, excuse me, at RSA and McAfee, uh, where he was responsible for the positioning of their security operations and automation platforms. Uh, when he's not focusing on enterprise security, Carl can be found hiking or kayaking with his wife, Rachel, and their six children. It's a man after my own heart. I only have four myself. So, um, well, Carl, uh, really excited to have you on here. And in my role here at ISOC, I work with organizations around the world uh, for various different platforms. And ServiceNow is consistently one of the ones that is thought of in the highest regard uh, that I receive the most questions about as they look to integrate it into their overall systems and tools. So really excited to chat with you here today. Um, as we get started, how are you doing today, Carl? I'm doing great. Really looking forward to the discussion and uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. So uh, the questions that I have for you here were driven by the uh, conversation back in September. Um, and so uh, let's go ahead and dig in. Uh, the first one here is, uh, tell me about the challenges of automating incident response. Yeah, so it, it's a big one, right? Um, we face a, a lot of challenges with our customers because they know they need to do it. They know as they looked for the resources that are out there, and what they need to accomplish with an, an ever escalating volume of threats, right? And vulnerabilities, um, that automation is clearly gonna be the answer. However, the biggest challenge is really starting out doing it. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed. It, you know, you can look at it and say, my gosh, how can I take all these, all these complex workflows and, and actually automate them? That can be scary and intimidating. So the biggest thing about it is take those challenges and, uh, quite frankly, make them a strong guidepost for you. In other words, don't tackle so many things. Look at that and say, wow, I, I really intuitively need to bust that up into some starting points and do those simple starting points that take some of the mundane tasks that you see your teams going through and just automate pieces of those mundane tasks. And that's that's one of the assets of what we do in, in our product and security operations, security and response is you can take all different areas of those workflows and pieces of them and choose where to automate and choose where to have intervention and actually have someone push the right button, so to speak. That makes a lot of sense. And there were a couple of words that you uh, spoke there that really came up in a lot of questions, right? This, this concept of there are risks behind doing this level of automation. And so this next question here uh, is along that same theme. Uh, what are some of the risk factors associated with automating incident response? Sure. One of the things that, you know, that always kind of goes back to a little bit what I was answering the last question is the competence folks have in that automation. In other words, do they feel they have the workflow right? And do they feel the tasks are correct to automate them so that they're addressing multiple threats, so to speak, because you're going to consistently use those similar workflows, right? So, so that's a big piece of it is recognizing that um, it, it's a reminder to go back to starting small and starting very confidently with those pieces you can automate, test a lot. And the great thing about solutions like ServiceNow with, Ses with SecOps is you can actually go ahead with our security and response solution and constantly be assessing where you are. And that's really one of the biggest ways to tackle that risk is to be able to take a look at, okay, how did that process perform? How do my analysts perform using that process? And you can actually do that type of assessment on demand in real time and report and see how you're doing with each of those areas 
And more importantly, do you need to shape and make change there for both the analyst benefit as well as the outcomes you're trying to achieve? So that's one of the biggest ways to tackle that risk part since they are there, right? You're talking about automating tasks that are part of security. So you want to constantly assess them, have that loop and make sure that you're checking that loop. That's a way for you to really make sure your, your teams are getting the benefits of the automation and that you can be constantly evolving those those steps and those tasks because you know they will evolve just like the threats do. Great insights. Great insights. Thanks, Carl. And so, you know, along those same lines, uh, as you speak about the benefits of the automation, right? Those are the reasons why we go through all this work to begin Absolutely. with. Absolutely. And this question here is very much in that same vein. Um, you know, how do you make sure that the automated incident response is effective? What are your thoughts on that, Carl? So it, it goes back to the loop that I mentioned briefly answering the last question. In other words, making sure that your reporting is there to see how you were doing yesterday, a week before, and a month before, right? And a year before, if possible. And one of the things you should always do is be doing just that. Um, because you want to go ahead and not only make sure you're refining those automations and those tasks and those workflows within, but also taking a look at, okay, I've done this. That means I can take these and apply them to these two or three other areas for my teams so that I can scale them. Ultimately, you know, the, the big benefit here of going through this automation is to be able to enable your teams to do more, to naturally scale them right through the automation. So if you're going ahead and paying a close focus into how you're doing that way and assessing that nonstop and doing that reporting, then you can see what else you can do next and go to that next level of maturing, so to speak, uh, the automation that you're doing with your teams. Now, um, here, here's a question that seems to be ever present for us, really having to do with staffing levels, right? And so... With a tool set like this, what's the impact on the security staff? And does that uh, result in a change to the response times uh, given what you have before the tool? Sure, we'll take that two ways. Um, let's take a look first and reverse that a bit and look at the response times. One of the things you can expect right away is a very dramatic uh, reduction in the response time. It is not uncommon for folks when they get some of those mundane automation tasks off the plate, like we've been talking through a little bit here, um, the response times will automatically go down 40, 50%. Um, extremely common that we see with uh, going ahead and uh, deploying security incident response, part of our security operations solution. Now, um, that's one benefit and that'll be ongoing and that'll be something that'll continue to get even better, right? And one, one of the things that I can say is we actually have one of our larger customers that did see that type of reduction, matter of fact, over 50%. And they saw that during a spike of threat volume on their enterprise that was, you know, a, a two, three X multiplier. So you do the math. It, it's a, you know, it's the outcome we're all, you know, we work so hard for our customers to achieve and love to see that customer have that outcome, obviously. Now, I'll switch over to another aspect, which is what is some of the experience and, you know, what is some of the outcomes for the teams themselves, for the analysts? And for the analysts, quite frankly, by being able to scale themselves so well, by having automation take a lot of those tasks off the plate, it enables them to get to some of the things you want them to get to. So there's actually a bit of, uh, let's be candid here, there is a bit of job satisfaction and job excitement over the fact that you get past the constant firefighting. That's a big plus. Uh, that's terrific. I, I agree absolutely, right? When, when your staff can be uh, directing their time towards the high value activities rather than exactly. the low value incident response activities, you really gain a lot of effectiveness as, as you've spoken about. Um, now, we've talked about the benefits, but this is a question from the other side of, of the coin, so to speak. Um, you know, what kind of financial investment can a, can a company expect to invest in tools like this? Can you give us a sense of what that looks like? So, um, the, you know, the, that varies from company to company. I mean, it all depends on just what size you are. Um, it can be an investment that, uh, to give a similarity, because I don't want to quote any dollar amounts, but the reality is you can spend as much as you might in an IAM 
or um, you can spend as much as you would in a sim, really depending on the size and type of organization you are, right, is the bottom line. So um, what you have to look at is, uh, and we have a, a great document that, um, you know, we can share out here as a resource, but, you know, there are, we actually had some great analyst studies done from a third party that show those financial benefits that you can realize. And that's something I definitely, uh, you know, encourage folks to take a close look at. There are some studies um, out there that show the value in deploying that security orchestration automation response solution such as ours. So I encourage you to take a look there and that'll give you some real dollars and cents. Great. Uh, so we'll definitely make sure that our listeners have an opportunity to check that out. Um, Related question, you know, what strategies have you seen be effective in order to get the resources, the time and the investment for organizations to make purchases uh, into uh, these types of tools? Can you share with us uh, any particular strategies or themes uh, that you've seen emerge? So one is to, um, you know, first off, um, stop what you're doing for a few minutes and take a look at what are your biggest challenges, right? If you're sitting here and your team is constantly underwater and no matter how much time they spend, so to speak, they're still underwater, then clearly you should be exploring these type of investments. And then secondly, understand exactly why they're underwater. Do you have a lot of broken uh, you know, workflows and et cetera? Because one of the, the biggest values you'll get out of this and one of the things that can really help with the assessment is taking a look at your own workflows. You have to understand what your workflows are, whether they're half broken, broken, or um, immature and, and have a lot of potential to be very effective. Be honest with yourself and your team and take a close look at those workflows and recognize where you can improve because that's where the solution can really come in with some of the workflows that are out of the box, as well as that capability of very easily building your, the workflows within the system that will absolutely 100% uh, reflect the needs you have within your particular organization. So again, it goes back to the old adage of really take a close look at assessing where your problems are so that you can apply the tool to the areas that it can be most beneficial to get you going and address some of those things that, quite frankly, are giving your teams a pain day and night and uh, keeping those of us who are responsible for those situations awake at night, right? Uh, I love that concept. I mean, those are the organizations that I see to implement these types of concepts most effectively, right? And those are not coincidentally places that I hear service now being mentioned all the time, right? Talking about governmental entities, financial institutions, military defense contractors, utilities. Those are the folks that I am constantly hearing uh, usage of tools. And also, because people are so busy, this requirement to step back how would you redesign? How would you do things differently, right? Exactly, uh, exactly. Right. There's so much that can come out of that assessment and being candid with yourself about why you're going down this road, right? It is a journey. It's the bottom line. No, no, excellent. Uh, so changing gears a little bit and getting a, a little bit closer to uh, ground level, I might say, uh, this question comes in asking, uh, can ServiceNow be implemented as, I, as a SIEM solution? Or does it only integrate with third-party applications? And for anybody that might not know, if you can clarify uh, SIEM for our listeners as well, Carl. Sure. So um, SIM, you know, is a, a core SOC foundation, security information event management, right? Um, been around forever in the scheme of things in the IT land, right? As far as log management in the early days and security information event management as, as it progressed. We are not a SIM. Um, and a SIM is not a SOAR. <laughs> so let me clarify there. Uh, you know, security orchestration automation response, um, much like SIM, requires its own focus area. Uh, SIM does a fantastic job, and we integrate with just about every SIM known to mankind. Um, invaluable data that you should have as part of your orchestration and automation definitions to understand where the priorities are and how you should respond. Um, so with that in mind, yes, we integrate with SIM and so many other aspects of your security and IT uh, deployments that you may have throughout the organization to get that clear, crisp picture of where you're most vulnerable and what your priorities should be for your teams as far as threats. So with that in mind, um, we're not a SIM, we're a SOAR, and SIM is invaluable, and quite frankly, we think SOARs do. Excellent. Okay. 
Um, Follow-up question on that. Uh, can you please give us your insights as to the most efficient ways to gather incident notifications from vendors? And uh, there's some of the sub questions here include, you know, uh, should there be a single vendor relationship owner? Should it be a team? Uh, it, how can IT be more proactive about getting this information? Sure. It really, the best way um, goes back to having those integrations. We constantly maintain a library of integrations on what is our ServiceNow store. So customers can, at uh, any time they want, as an integration becomes available, download it. That is still going to be your best bet to make sure you're getting them timely and direct. After all, they are incidents. You ought to have them as soon as they're declared, right? Um, every second can count in the scheme of things. So I really encourage folks to make use of the integrations we have in the store, but also um, we have various tools, uh, including an integration hub that allows you to go ahead and take in just about everything ever known to mankind or unknown to mankind, so to speak. Um, so with that, stay focused on integrations. That's the most direct way. And that's really going to give the response you're driving for. Uh, to make sure that there is no delay in getting those invaluable insights in right away. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, so for my next question, um, this one is returning to something that a little bit more broad. Um, do you see that most organizations are using NIST or ISO or other frameworks? So interesting. Um, I'm seeing a variety of frameworks. I see NIST out there. Um, definitely, uh, I saw, of course, but what I do see, um, particularly in our area, uh, are some of the threat intelligence frameworks. Um, so we see a great deal of that, particularly when we think of MITRE and others that truly give that adversarial intent and that adversarial profiling. So I do believe that um, very strongly that all of these have a value. Uh, you need to decide for, you know, for your organization which ones fit. And I say that because many of them have heavy slants towards uh, one industry or another and et cetera. Um, so you need to understand that when you're looking at which ones to support and integrate and have be a part of uh, what you do for prioritization and, and have that different weighting. So, but there are some great ones to choose from. I really encourage, uh, you, you know, all folks out there to, to take a close look at the ones that best align with their organizational needs. Uh, that's a great insight. And I, I will add from my personal experience, you know, people you need to select frameworks that are manageable for their organization. Right? Well said. That's well said. One of the biggest challenges, right? And and the beauty of ServiceNow is that it enables you to, no matter which framework you're using, um, I have seen people that tag to NIST and they use ServiceNow and people that tag Correct. to ISO and use ServiceNow. And then the many industry specific ones like MITRE, as, as you mentioned. So yes. This, that's in play and in practice. Uh, today in many of the world's top flight organizations. Agreed. And we, you know, we also integrate with GRC. So basically beyond those controls and et cetera, that's pretty much limitless how much you can take that type of data in and apply it to the right, uh, you know, the right situation, the right threat and the right decision. Excellent. Um, so next question that I have here, uh, does, maybe we just answered it. Does <laughs> ServiceNow integrate MITRE, uh, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this attack uh, into its SOAR platform. So, does ServiceNow integrate MITRE ATT&CK into its SOAR platform? So we do. We we actually have a very strong integration with uh, with MITRE ATT&CK. Um, essentially, um, you know, some of our customers have even stated it's it's truly the first way they've been able to operationalize MITRE ATT&CK because I know it's invaluable, but it can be very daunting and, and complex. Now we go ahead and actually do that integration and populate it into the fields and et cetera that are appropriate with SOAR so that you can actually pull down the heat maps and see the exact profiling of where someone might go. I can't say enough about the values of MITRE attack with SOAR. Uh, you know, we just see as customers literally can uh, almost play a game of chess, right? It, it's proverbially being able to know what your opponent's doing next. That's exactly what you're able to see. So um, it is a tremendous asset. And again, uh, one that we've seen many of our customers uh, adopt and it, it's really been a, you know, a light in the dark in many cases, it's tremendous. Excellent. Um, so another question about MITRE ATT&CK here. Uh, what can you tell us about the cost of subscribing to MITRE ATT&CK frameworks 
and the typical costs of being able to implement in terms of time and resources required. Sure. Um, I can tell you about the cost. I, honestly, that's one I can't go down. What I can say um, is that I touched on a bit, the ability to get it up and running and adding value into your prioritization and your responses um, is dramatically shortened by running it through uh, ServiceNow Security Instant Response because we actually have that direct integration. It'll automatically populate and become part of different workflows. Um, literally, we have playbooks, et cetera, um, all tied to MITRE. So uh, once you figure out whatever the licensing requirements are from a MITRE perspective and, and what might happen there, um, operationalizing it, so to speak, and adopting it into our SOAR uh, is uh, you know, all a direct integration. So that's something we spend a great deal of time with our customers making sure we got right. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and that that idea of costs and, and resources required certainly is on all of our minds right now, right? Uh, Absolutely. And, and so we see that continuing to come up in our questions here. Uh, here's a, a similar way to ask that same question, but perhaps... I uh, would be interested in get your idea of a proportion here, right? Um, when I'm looking to utilize my security budget, uh, should we be investing more in tools and technology or towards personnel resources? Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Carl? <laughs> Both wherever you can, just to be candid. Um, if you can actually get some of those resources to hire, good for you. Share that little secret with the rest of the world because it's a struggle, right? Um, they are proverbial unicorns. So with that said, um, it should always be a balance, right? It should not be one or the other. Now, I will you know, also add to that, um, not just because I'm a vendor, but the reality is um, if you don't have the right tools for the right folks, um, it's not gonna matter how many of them you have. Uh, it's not something you can just throw people at. This is a people and technology. Um, because let's face it, our adversaries are investing a great deal in technology and they move at machine speed so we need to do that too so um you know there has to be a good balance between getting the most out of your folks and having the right tools in their hand to go up against what are very advanced adversaries in this day and age let's just be candid with ourselves that's right it's so much more difficult than to protect than to attack and well, these organizations Bingo. yes yeah. Yeah, it, it's great to see the work that's being done to help these organizations uh, be able to defend themselves and be able to uh, perform that blue team activity that, that we're also dependent on. Right? Yes, correct. <laughs> um, next question I have here. Uh, so what do you say to companies and executive management who feels that uh, an IT department handling SOC is an appropriate structure? Um. I say in response that they are part of it. Absolutely. Um, we are way past this ivory tower approach that has gone on, you know, for many a year, uh, which is security operations is in one area and IT is over here, right? Um, that cannot exist. And quite frankly, IT, risk, security all need to work together. Uh, so I would say that they are not the ones to run it. Um, but they should be a darn strong part of it, right? And as to where you align it, well, you know, that that's all according to the organization. Let's be honest. It might sit under IT. It might sit under, hell, I've seen it sit under risk. So, it, you know, where is it going to be? But I feel that the teams need to work together. And a lot of what we do at ServiceNow with our security and response solution, our security operation solutions overall, is make sure that the workflows involve both IT and security, which they have to for resolution. And ultimately we make sure that those workflows reflect what IT teams do and what security teams do. So it's a big step, uh, you know, and why our customers see some success is because we're not giving one team in one language uh, to do resolution, you know, coming from the team in a different language. So they're actually speaking the language of what they do every day and how they resolve things. So it's a big effort in the right direction. So my response to them would always be, they need to work together. Yeah, great insight. That's what I've absolutely observed. The really old school companies, the SOC team reports to finance. 
Whenever I see that, I say, okay, guys, we need some changes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, interestingly enough, I mean, organizations have come around. Um, recently, we we commissioned a study and it re, you know, reported that over three quarters of enterprises out there recognized and had planned for IT and SOC to work together, period. They were making that statement. So it's good to see that come around. Uh, you know, this is bigger than just one organization, right? And security is everyone's responsibility is a very, you know, colloquial statement that's said a lot, but you know what? It's true. <laughs> Bottom line. Yeah. Great thoughts. Um, so uh, here's another question, uh, kind of along the line of, of frameworks here. Uh, when going through a mapping process, um, you know, in our organization, we do the framework, then the regulation, then the control, then the testing. Is this the right approach or is there something that you would change or recommend with regard to that? Um, I, I think that approach makes perfect sense. I think your big thing that you need to do is making sure that you can trial these and do that assessment. In other words, put that in play and be able to assess it very quickly. That's one of the areas that I mentioned earlier answering questions is, um, you know, utilizing our ability to do the the reporting right down to the analysts, the workflow, the task, et cetera, and be able to measure what it's doing and how it's performing. So going down that road makes sense. Add to that just the fact that you have a true way to do closed loop assessment and make sure that it's doing what you're trying to accomplish with that. Yeah, I can confirm that's absolutely been my observation as well. That That's the right approach, right? And uh, when you have a tool that enables you to perform that appropriate testing, that that is essential to the entire process, right? You Correct. can't fall down at the end. You can't, and, and you can't just focus it on the, you know, in pen testing and other things, it, it's got to be tested, you know, across the enterprise because its tendrils are going to be everywhere, right? Just like we're talking about, they need to work together. Well, the different workflows will touch all kinds of organizations. So you need to do an assessment that can take a look at it and see how it interacted across the board. So, excellent. Um, so, uh, next question. Uh, I have just two more questions just to uh, give a little bit of a time check. Um, how can automation facilitate? controlling third-party risks? That's a big question. That is a huge question. <laughs> so, um, you know, so let's bust this up in a couple ways. One, if you want to get a better handle on risk, that means it goes back to some of the, the commentary we had earlier, which is, um, it, you know, if you're automating things, and you should be, that enable your teams to focus on uh, other areas that they should too strategically and for the long term, and be constantly being able to take a look at what is our threat posture and how do we improve it, i.e. ultimately then reducing risk. Um, that's one of the benefits right out of the gate, right? Um, the second one, when you take a look at it, is the ability to go ahead on focus on risk to begin with. Uh, if you've freed it up to do that and be able to understand better where the risks are, then they can actually reach across the chasm, so to speak, with the different teams and work on reducing that risk from a more strategic posture. So they've done two things. They've technically uh, reduced some of the risks that they would have daily in the organization and be able to contribute strategically to reducing that risk ongoing uh, as opposed to day by day. Got it. So question to that. How, how does that apply to regulatory requirements? Is it different or what's your, how does your approach change uh, when satisfying that requirement or regulation? Sure, it, it contributes to it um, a great deal and that, that's a checkpoint, right? So you've got the check boxes of regulatory, your traditional DRC, um, but you also need to be able to show those proof points and you need to be able to report on that on demand and you need to be able to run that up and make sure that that is actually trackable and something that could be held accountable. Um, having that type of reporting, like I mentioned, uh, that we do and being able to assess how you've done and where you've improved or where you haven't and show what you're doing to fix that, that's all the type of uh, you know performance reporting you can get out of the security incident response solution. And that contributes greatly to be able to say, okay, that's how we then need to change these controls and if you can report up to that, that means you're actually able to report for your compliance mandates and show what you're doing to fix or evolve those as needed, right? That's a very strong piece of it. Great. And so, Carl, this is my last question from our listeners. Uh, this says, 
Uh, often resolution requires engagement of resources outside of IT and security. What are your recommendations on how to best approach the rest of the business for efficient and timely outcomes? Um, one of the things that we enable is you can actually go ahead and have, uh, you know, for lack of better terminology, um, shared war room areas and things like that. You can also go ahead and have chats actually just like, you know, Chris, you and all and I can do when, when we have these type of discussionary Q&A times. Um, our solution actually enables them to have that with anyone within the organization and third parties um, that are approved by their organization. So they have that capability to reach out and say, these folks that are responsible, here's all the information I'm sending us to you. Here's the recommended uh, resolution and here's the feedback loop so they can go ahead and connect and know that that was done and be able to close that loop. So we enable them to reach out to, of course, the organizations within the enterprise, but also the outside third parties. Let's face it, a lot of organizations have certain areas they SOC that may be uh, outsourced, et cetera. Um, and we are built with that in mind to be able to tie into those organizations and, and do workflow through them as well. Terrific. Carl, one last bonus question that I want to get. Yes, sir. Out. A bonus what's, round. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, what security tools should our listeners be looking to in order to prioritize and orchestrate these workflows? Got any recommendations? Anything at all you can <laughs> So, obviously, us. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of great tools out there, but seriously, um, you know, we uh, at ServiceNow, we, it came from inside. In other words, we developed, we developed it with our own SOC and some, uh, some small acquisitions and investments that, that we felt were so effective for our teams. And that's where we started to do more with our customers and productize this up. So it's actually something that, uh, that you know, was developed coming from the right intent and, and seeing that success from our own organization. So uh, we're very excited to, to continue to share it and expand our customer base. And, and again, I, I hope these questions and the presentation were uh, a great help to some of the challenges that I know we all face out there. We face it as well. Well, Carl, that's all the time we have. Uh, listeners, thank you for tuning in uh, and taking the time to chat with us here today to learn about ServiceNow. Uh, and this terrific presentation. I'm Chris Damali, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Offstage, Offscript. We hope you enjoyed this episode. 